Hello and welcome back to Giant Reviews. This is the start of a new book. Finally, a non Young Cho Han book, but maybe I will cover probably The Agony of Eros next. Uh, this, I hope everyone has had a, a good New Year and a good Christmas. I certainly have uh, done a lot of thinking about things now that I've turned 30 years old, uh, you know, 30 year old wizard. But. What I'm covering here is something that I feel I should set aside all my usual jolly meme, you know, wholesome chungus, laughy jokey type of stuff. Because what I'm covering here is a, a really a monumental work, even if you do not agree with it. A monumental work in contemporary um, French or post-French continental theory or post-Foucauldian work especially a book that has garnered a lot of academic currency. And I feel that even though it may be incredibly hostile to, what would you say, again with the memes, uh, based world politics, quote unquote, I think that it's not only worthy to study if there is at all any common ground, because one thing that I think is interesting with Janet Reviews is that I have to be consciously aware of the fact that I'm trying to give credence to these works of, uh, you know, primarily French new left academia. But I have to be consciously aware of the fact that I have a predominantly right wing audience. And even though I myself may be, uh, you know, not in agreement with these works in particular 100%, I feel like they're important enough to at least study to know what is a driving motivation, at least in the very high ends of predominantly leftist academia. But I wouldn't necessarily characterize it as such. Now, the work I'm covering now, I have to caution beforehand, it won't be like Byung Chul Han. I'm not going to have to read every single line of the book. I'm going to have to like, you know, not skim, but highlight the pertinent points. This time I'm covering, as a series, Achille Mbembes, or Mbembes, depending on how you pronounce it. I believe it's pronounced Mbembe, the M may be silent. Uh, Achille or Achille Mbembe's Necropolitics. Now, this book has, of course, because of the whole, you know, Trump thing, in the past you know, decade or so, not, not decade, this came out, relatively recently this came out uh and this my version is duke university press 2019 so the past few years oh the but the, of course the original version was in 2016 so for the past four years this has been quite a popular book of course uh, you know the whole trump thing as you can guess why it's a popular book but barring that aside i don't want that to obscure your view the reason i'm covering this is because I like to think of myself, even though I'm on the political right, I still operate mostly within, academically, within the sort of tradition of Foucault and Agamben and so forth. And this is a logical extension of that. Mbembe, Mbembe is really, I would say, apart from Agamben, because Agamben's still, you know, with us, thank God. He's really sort of the jumping off point from... Foucault, then Agamben, then Mbembe's. And so I feel like it would do justice to the work if I covered it extensively. Now, a lot of the topics that we're going to cover, I shall say that, you know, a lot of his work, a lot of Mbembe's work, is contrary to the history of Western philosophy in terms of Hegel and Bataille. You know, Bataille I'm obviously more familiar with. In terms of their relation to death, the limited experience, and the possibilities of death within a greater historiography of the world, within politics, within aesthetics, and so forth. And Necropolitics is truly a monumental work of uh, scholarship, although he sort of editorializes these thinkers to his advantage, critiquing them. And he really is sort of not just the higher of Foucault, but also the higher of Franz Fanon, and that sort of post-colonial tradition within continental philosophy. So this is, again, I'm consciously aware of the fact that 
yes, I am speaking for a, you know, based red pilled frog audience, and I myself am one, but I hope to give a fair shake to the book because I feel that even contrasting this book to the contemporary political right, even though, you know, I mean, I'm sure Bembe would, you know, he'd balk at this, right? But I feel that it's it's important because it gives a perspective that there, yes, there may be some common ground, but also even in contrast, there is value to analyzing this work. And there is value to explicate what he is critiquing at the heart of Western society, being very much outside of it. I mean, you know, he's very much inside of it as a scholar and a thinker. But of course, he, you know, he brings in his own past and post-colonialism and the, the sort of contemporary thinking that's coming out of a lot of different places in Africa. And so this is a very challenging book, either way you cut it, but especially if you're on the political right. But let me, let me read fully the forward and then I will go to the, the, number, the first chapter. But this is from the back of the book. So in Necropolitics, Achille or Achille Mbembe, a leader in the new wave of Francophone critical theory, theorizes the genealogy of the contemporary world a world plagued by ever-increasing inequality, militarization, enmity, and terror, as well as by resurgence of, uh, here we go, racism, fascism, nationalism, <laughs> forces determined to exclude and, and you know, redact. I, again, I'm going to have to use a lot of opposite words if I even want to, you know, hope to get this on YouTube. He outlines how democracy has begun to embrace its dark side, what he calls its nocturnal body, which is based on the desire, fears, affections, relations, and violence that dry, drove colonialism. Now, again, I, I, I would disagree with him there in the extent that, it, you know, when you really examine the target of the modern, uh, you know, global uh, global American empire and its own populations, and well, we'll get into that. This shift has allowed our democracy, thereby eroding the very values, rights, and freedoms liberal democracy routinely celebrates. Well, he's got a point there. As a result, war has become the sacrament of our time in a conception of sovereignty that operates by annihilating all those considered em enemies of the state. Well, I mean, even in the contemporary war in the blue-yellow country, we're seeing this as well. Despite his dire diagnoses, Mbembe draws on post-Foucauldian debates on biopolitics, war, and race, as well as on Fanon's notion of care as a shared vulnerability to explore how new conceptions of the human that transcend human humanism might come to pass. So again, he's explicitly critiquing humanism as well. Like, like, and this is, he's correct. Like, you know, liberal, mushy liberal humanism, for all of its flaws, has really gotten us into a lot of these situations. But maybe he's saying this for different reasons than, say, the political right would. The contemporary political right, the contemporary dissident right, e-right, whatever. But we'll get into all of these things. These new concept conceptions would allow us to encounter the other, not as a thing to exclude, but as a person with whom to build a more just world. And of course, so we have a foreword by uh, Judith Butler talking about the zone of non-being, which we will cover. Bembe not only engages with biopolitics, the politics of enmity and the state of exception, he also opens up the possibility of a global ethnic, one that relies less on the sovereign power than on the transnational resistance to spread of the death world. Well, that that's, by all accounts, that's pulling in some ways. This is complicated, though with the contemporary, in my analysis, the contemporary geopolitical situation where the global south is aligning with powers that the Western media certainly has called quote-unquote fascist because they feel that their way of life is spreading, is, is sorry, is threatening, and that the ideas that are alien to them are, you know, sort of colonizing them anew. But now it's under the pretext of the liberal rules-based order. So you can easily see, even just by this forward, that these, the, the, yes, the, the radical left-wing post-colonial politics of Mbembe is, you know, when you give it the sort of picture of the contemporary situation around the war in the blue-yellow country, around, you know, China's, obviously China's dominance of the global south is problematic for, you know, these populations as well, but how they're basically accepting these Chinese deals this, the geopolitical picture, I think, and, and perhaps Bembe is conscious of this, does not reflect the picture of contemporary, especially contemporary North American academics. 
So we will get into that and more. Again, you have to realize that I will do a lot of editorializing and that the, my views do not necessarily reflect. Like, if you want an equal, now, like a fair quote-unquote analysis, like go to Philosophy and Theory or some of these other YouTube channels, I mean, which are good, which are valuable. But I feel like I have to explain things in my own way. So I hope that I explain these texts in a fair manner as well as giving my own input and ideas and unique perspective being someone on the e-right who is willing to engage with these texts. So let me go to the introduction, which I will read verbatim. Then we will go to chapter one, which is called Exit from Democracy. So acknowledgements, so forth. Introduction, the ordeal of the world. If you want to make use of a book, simply pick up, picking it up will not suffice. My original aim was to write a book that not a hint of mystery shrouded. In the end, I found myself with a short essay of sketched hutch hutcheries of parallel chapters of more or less discontinuous lines of raw and rapid gestures and even slight movements of withdrawal followed by abrupt reversals. Well, that's, I, I, I feel him. I feel, I feel um, Mbembe here because I, I too, this is the way I write, you know. It is true that roughness of the topic did not afford a violin note. It was not even to suggest the presence of bone, a skull, or a skeleton inside of the element. This bone, this skull, and this skeleton all have names. Repopulation of the earth, exit from democracy, society of enmity, relation without desire, voice of blood and terror, and counter-terror as our times medication and poison. Chapter 1 and 2. Also, he talks about um, how necropolitics becomes diffused as well actually there was a theory and philosophy video that talks about this book where someone in the comments mentioned how the video neglected how th these processes are becoming diffused from non-state actors but i'm sure we'll get into this as well in any case the text is one in which surface the reader can glide freely without control points or visas sojourning as long as desired moving about at will returning and leaving at any moment and through any door well, I would say that most academic texts are like this, in my opinion. That I have to, like, picture a mental map. That's how I really have gotten through, as an artist, gotten through complicated, you know, academic tomes. Is I have mental pictures, almost like, you know, how Helena Off Klimt, when she was painting her abstract works of art, they were sort of theosophy roadmaps, if you will. They're really charts more than they were the work of art. But, of course... The only way that she found expression was in the work of art. So, or at least acceptability when it comes to, you know, contemporary, contemporary art world. Of course, the contemporary art world of the 19th century. Or 18th century, 19th century, I forget. Every gesture of writing is intended, so then he goes on. The reader may set off in any direction to maintain in relation to each other, each of its words, and to end of its affirmations, an equal critical distance. Critical distance as if need be a hint of skepticism. Every gesture of writing is intended to engage a force, or even a def deferented, uh, deferent, which I here call an element. In the present case, we are dealing with a raw element in a dense force. This is the force of separation rather than one in bond that is bond intensifying. A force of scission and real isolation that is exclusively turned up itself in that which pretending to ensure the world's governments seeks exemption from it. So again, this is necropolitics, which he's described, that has freed itself from the nation state, which Mumbebi will go on to say parallels global liberalism itself. So what follows is a reflection of today's planetary scale renewal of the relation of enmity and its multiple reconfigurations. Its pivotal point is the platonic concept of thermacon, the idea of a medication that acts as once a remedy and a poison. So the dreams of the global liberal rules-based end of history order is of course shattered. Well, we'll see why. The idea of a medication that acts as once a remedy and a poison. Ferenc Fanon's political and psychiatric work forms a part of a basis from my showing how in the wake of decolonization, war in the figures of conquest and occupation, of terror and counterinsurgency, has become the sacrament of our time at this, the turn of the 21st century. And 
what's funny is that, you know, even this little line in this introduction, you have to really know the meaning behind it. You have to know the references. Here he is referencing two critical thinkers to his project. He has in mind Franz Fanon and Michel Foucault. Fanon is very interesting because he goes into the psychology of the colonized. He learns this from Sartre, of course. He learns this from the French existential tradition. The body of the condemned. The psychology of being a colonized subject. You know, he talks about, uh, what's the term he calls? It wasn't species being, it was... He talks about sort of the conglomeration of the predominantly African colonized subject having their psyches displaced by the colonizer. And so it's a political psychology, if you will. But also Foucault. And he says that it's like a, a, you know, a medicine that hurts as well as heals. But war as sacrament of time, what is this from? This is from Foucault's inversion of Clausewitz. Which is that, you know, politics is war by another means. Meaning that war is constant. War is in every institution. It is the war for demographics. How to control them, make them more malleable. The war in the schools. The war in the prisons. The war, well, actually in geopolitics. Everything is war. Because the model of war is never-ending conflict that arrives at a victory which achieves a stasis or an equilibrium. But that stasis never comes. It always justifies it. Politics, the model of warfare, the model of a military barracks, informs all life. This is the, you know, this is Foucault 101. So, the way that society and life is regimented in the military barracks, the way that expert knowledges go into and craft the first academic think tanks were essentially just like war chambers. They, you know, some of the oldest think tanks in the world are like the one in Britain, the uh, Society for the Study of War and so forth. They were essentially just like uh, military college think tanks that were attached to strategizing warfare. And that model proliferated throughout society. So moving on. This transformation has liberated movements of passion that are increasingly pushing liberal democracy to don the garb of the exception, to perform unconditioned acts in a fairway places, faraway places, and to seek to exercise dictatorship over themselves and against their enemies. Among other things, I ponder the consequences of the inversion and the novel turns, terms with, within which the question of relation between violence and law, norm and exception, the state of war and the state of security and the state of freedom are now proposed or posed. Backdropped by the war's near the world's narrowing and the earth's repopulation, as well as new cycles of population movements. This essay endeavors not merely to open new paths for a critique of atavistic nationalisms. Indirectly, it also reflects the possible foundations of a mutually shared genealogy and thus of a politics of a living beyond humanism. I would say that nationalism in a, is in a way a form of post-liberal humanism, but uh, you know, a lot of academics are not ready for that one. So, But notice how th those same processes of, you know, of, of uh, what was happening in the Middle East, how they're arriving home now. Notice that. Notice how that happened seamlessly in the 2010s for a variety of reasons, but we'll get to that. This book indeed details and deals with the sort of arrangement with the world or even of its use that as the beginning of the century consists in counting whatever is not oneself for nothing. This process has a genealogy and a name, the race for separation and delinking, a race being run against the backdrop of a simple anxiety of annihilation. Nowadays, a good many individuals are beset with dread, afraid of having been invaded and being on the verge of disappearing. Entire peoples labor under the apprehension that the resources for continuing to assume their identities are spent. They maintain that an outside no longer exists, such as to protect themselves against threats and dangers, the enclosures must be multiplied. 
wanting not to remember anything any longer, least of all their own crimes and misdeeds. They dream of bad objects that return to haunt them, and they then seek violently to rid themselves of it. Well, I know what he's referring to, but, you know, for YouTube purposes, at least in this portion, I can't uh, say it. But, well, I mean, the, the, the argument over demography is a very hot-button topic, so... Constantly contriving the evil genies by which they are possessed and that in the spectacular, spectacular turnaround now surround them. They have begun to raise questions. These questions are similar to those non-Western societies were asking only recently. Caught as they were in the snare of the far more destructive forces of colonialism, colonization, imperialism. Questions such as can the other in the light of all that is happening still be regarded as my fellow creature? When the extremes are broached, as in the case for us here and now, precisely what does my and the other's humanity consist in? The other's burden having become too overwhelming, would it not be better for my life to stop being linked to its presence as much as to mine? Why must I, despite all opposition, nevertheless look after the other, stand as close as possible to his life if, in return, his only aim is to my ruin? Well, I wonder what he's, what he's alluding to there. Alluding to there with Western civilization, I wonder. But, you know, um, implicitly based? I don't know. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, I say these words, but the reality is, is that there is a very... There's a reason why Western populations, at least a fraction of them, uh, of certain political persuasions are anxious about these questions. And it's fun... It's, it is... I, I will say that Mbembe is giving credence to those anxieties, saying that, well, obviously they're real. I mean, he's saying that, well, you know, actually, well, colonialism is the reason, you know, why this is happening and, you know, you probably deserve it. Not that he says he probably deserves it because he wants to find a way out of it. So he's not your typical garden variety activist, but he's still acknowledging that, yes, these anxieties are there. Like the 2010s have been overwhelmingly about these anxieties in all fields of life you know, racially, culturally, in terms of gender, you name it. So, so, but he poses this question, well, you know, how can we live with the other if they're only, if they only aim for my ruin? I wonder, uh, how can you solve that question, right? If ultimately humanity exists only through being in and of the world, can we find a relation with others based on the reciprocal recognition of our common vulnerability and finitude? So it's almost as if he's in a way you know, taking a much more, um, a different but at the same time equal position of Heidegger when he talks about our own shared mortality, our finitude, our being as the sign. But, you know, Heidegger would then, we all know, listen, we all know the politics of Heidegger, okay? He would say that there is a rootedness that is being, you know, Heidegger in so many words says that the dwelling of a, of a, a Dasein, of a people even, within a community of morals is being threatened by, you know, technics, by other various forces. And so, you know, not that Mbembe would definitely not agree with Heidegger in a lot of ways, but he still brings up this question of, okay, what unites us? It's being towards death. It is finitude. So, but can you create a politics from that? Can you create a planetary politics from that? This is what Bembe is trying to see. So, today manifesting little interest is shown in making the circle more inclusive. Rather, the idea is to make borders as the primitive form of keeping at bay enemies, intruders, and strangers. All those who are not other of us. In a world characterized more than ever by an unequal distribution of capacities for mobility, in which the only chance of survival for many is to move and to keep on moving. The brutality of borders is now fundamentally given over time. Borders are no longer sites to be crossed, but lines that separate. Within these more or less miniaturized and militarized spaces, everything is supposed to be, remain still. Many are those who, encouraging them, now meet their ends and or when si not simply victims of shipwrecks or electrocution, are deported. Well, I, I, I mean, I don't see the deportations, but, you know. But it, it, it does bring up the question of, like, borders and citizenship, how... I think, you know, the political right, you know, a lot of the political right does come up of this question that, okay, say you secure the borders. Say immigration is restricted. 
say there actually is mass deportations, the way there were, you know, ironically enough, the way there were under Obama. What would happen? You presuppose a stasis, right? Like, I mean, even much older theorists of the political right would say that, no, that, you know, a, a largely predominantly European, you know, nation needs a form of Faustian spirit to keep it propelled, to keep it going forward. And when that burns out, like, like again, it's funny Mbembe is bringing this up, but even within the political right in the Western world, there is this debate, like there's this critique of quote unquote Shire nationalism where everyone gets their own little nation and we're all like living in the Hobbit Shires and nothing grows, nothing you know, changes. That is the real return to tradition. But we know that at the heart of Western civilization is something different. And it's almost as if academics begrudgingly admit this, like, you know, of course, like a lot of like left activists, well, all of them want to, you know, stop stop this and destroy it because it's evil it's you know racist and so forth but it does pose a valuable question is that okay say you did say this was true say that you secure the borders what would happen what dynamism would still be there there are huge problems to address within western civilization so that's an interesting quandary today we see the principles of equality being undone by the laws of atoshali and common origins, let me let me say this again, autochthony and common origin, as well as by divisions within citizenship, which is to say the letters dec declaration into pure citizenship, that is of native born, right? The, you know, heritage Americans, for instance, and borrowed citizenship, not one less, one that less secure from the start is now not safe from forfeiture. Confrontation with the perilous situation to characteristic of the age, the question, at least in appearance, is no longer to know how to reconcile the exercise of life and freedom with the knowledge of truth, solicitude for those differences from oneself. From now on, it is to know how, in a sort of primitive outpouring, to actualize the will to power by means that are half cruel, half virtuous. But those anxieties, I mean... We look at them. That's true. The heritage American discourse. This, the founding stock of European countries. In, in the age of mass mobility of populations and globalization, these questions become pertinent. Now, Mbembe would say that, oh, this is bad. But he does raise that question. Like, this is defining our age, and you can't ignore it. So, again, this is me trying to be charitable. Consequently, war is determined, is a determined as end and necessity, not only in democracy, but also in politics and culture. War has become both re remedy and poison, our pharmacon. It transform, it's a transformation into the pharmacon of our time, has in turn let loose gruesome passions that are unceasingly pushed on our societies to exit democracy, and as we and as was the case under colonization, to transform into societies of enmity. Under contemporary conditions, the societies of the North are not left unscathed by this. Interesting. Planetary renewal of colonial relations and their multiple reconfigurations, all of which is only amplified through the war on terror and the global scale creation of a state of exception. Now what today could really discuss... Now today we could really discuss... War as the pharmacon of our time without calling on Franz Fanon, in whose shadow this essay has been written. Colonial war, since this is essentially what Fanon speaks about, is ultimately, if not the matrix of the nomos of the earth, the law. But law that is higher. Not just codified law, but an impermeable law that is the binding of society, the nomos, whose basis from which society is grown from. Right? The demos. No most of the earth in the last instance is then at least a privileged means of its institutionalization. As wars of conquest and occupation and in many aspects of extermination, colonial wars were simultaneously wars of siege as much as foreign wars and the racial wars. So he talks about siege a lot. Like the, like the, the concept of a siege warfare is very pertinent in his mind because that becomes an operational model for contemporary politics as well as like physical siege wars. So... Also, yes, yeah, I know the meme, the book Siege, but but when you think of it, like the 
a, a critique of that book would almost be someone like Bembe saying, well, yes, of course, you know, Siege imagines this apocalyptic racially based warfare. And he was saying, well, you know, a lot of French academics would say that this idea isn't like far off the mark. That like in the lurid fantasies of a lot of like, well, Austrian painter fans, that this is the basis of like warfare transforming society. All of life becomes war in a sense. And we'll see the implications of that. But, you know, I know like as soon as they say that word, a lot of like people is, you know, it's like, yes, yeah, funny meme, skull mask, you name it. Like, yeah, okay, funny meme. Let's move on from, like, let's move on from the 2015 memes, okay? Let's, let's, let's keep it, you know, let's keep it, you know, copacetic. I was going to say civilized, but even that connotation, I realized that itself, like, th that has, um, you know, I mean, a leftist analysis would say that, well, yes, that, that term is very problematic when you say civilized, because it implies, you know, civilization being the norms of one particular civilization, but then, yeah, but then that just evolves into paralysis when you start to critique your own language. But I would say, keep it copacetic, I'm trying to reduce my meme verbiage as I go along, so. Pure and simple, a feeling of existing. Similar to the majority of contemporary wars, including the war on terror and the division forms of occupation, colonial wars were wars of extraction and predation. Predation. On the sides of the winners and the losers alike, they invariably lead to the ruin of something unfigurable, almost nameless, entirely difficult to pronounce. So again, he's talking about Agamben, Agamben's concept of bare life, of the Muslim, which we'll get into. How can one recognize in the enemy's face that one seeks to blow away but whose wounds one could equally treat as another face that renders them in their full humanity and thus as similar to oneself so he talks about this in chapter three the forces of passion these wars release have increased tenfold humanity's faculty to divide themselves they compelled some people to confess more openly that in the past their most repressed desires and to communicate more directly than before with their most obscure myths. And actually, he is right about this. As these divisions intensify, I mean, we see this all the time. We see the discourse moving in these more open directions. And of course, he would say that, like Bataille, you know, de death has a funny way of turning our humanity on itself by exposing humanity as animal in those peak experiences to risk death is that sort of battalion limit experience. But he's saying that as society gets more chaotic and divided, then these, you know, honest and true feelings are revealed. They become intense. I mean, as for example, you know, we all know this, the political left as they ramp up their persecution of, you know, heritage stock populations, then, you know, sort of by, by force, a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise start to think thoughts about their position, their identity, their means of self-preservation that they wouldn't have before. And the reason, and, and when you have to really examine it, this is, and, and this is where Mbembe is, you know, right, is that the liberal project breeds this. It comes from that. Of course, the political right would say something different as to, as to how the liberal project breeds this. But nevertheless, the analysis is at least partially correct from you know both positions. So more, confess more openly in the past than more repressed desires. In others, they open the chance to exit their abysmal sleep and experience, perhaps for the first time and only time, the power of being of surrounding surrounding worlds, and incidentally the chance to suffer their own vulnerability and completeness. In others, still, they afforded the experience of being touched and affected by this brutal exposure to unknown suffering of others, as well as a chance to abruptly exit the cir circle of indifferences in which they had once walled themselves off and to answer this call of their innumerable bodies of pain. Confronted with the colonial power in war, Fanon understood that these, the only subject is the living one. As living, the subject is immediately open to the world. Fanon gra gasped 
or grasped his own life only by understanding that life of the other living and non-living beings, for only then did he himself exist as a living form. And only then could he rectify the asymmetry of relations and introduction into them, a dimension of reciprocity and care for humanity. This is care for the living, which in a way, okay, let's, let's talk about the implications here for a little bit. So let us examine these words here, which is very important. Fanon understood that the only subject is a living one. As living, the subject is immediately open unto the world. Fanon grasped his own life only by understanding the life of others and non-living beings. For only then did he himself exist as a living form. And only then can he rectify the asymmetry of relations and introduce, introduce into them a dimension of reciprocity and care for humanity. On the other hand, Fanon regarded the gesture of care as a practice of resymbolization, the stakes of which is possibility of reciprocity and uh, maturity mutuality um, mutuality as authentic encounter with the other he is advice to colonized peoples who refuse castration was to turn their black backs on europe in other words he suggests that one begins with oneself and stands tall outside the categories that brought one to bow and scrape the difficulty involved not only one's being ass assigned a race but one's internalizing of the terms of this ass assignment a citation that is one's coming to the point of desiring and becoming the accomplice of castration for, for everything or nearly everything encountered and encouraged colonial people colonized peoples to inhabit as their skin and the truth in fiction that the other has produced in their regard so Franz Fennel of course was a clinical psychiatrist or a psychologist as well psychiatrist or psychologist yeah I believe he was a psychologist uh let me let me look this up um Yes, he was a French Western Indian psychiatrist. Oh, psychiatrist, exactly, yes. He was very much a man of the scientific method. But notice the terms there, that of the living. But what Mbembe is saying is that Fanon brings this engagement with the living, but there is this whole body of the dead. And in a way, it's this sort of messianic hope of reconciliation, of justice for the dead. That they too have a say in politics because death is the driving force of contemporary politics. Or even modern politics in the age of colonies, right? But it's an engagement of the living. It's very Heideggerian. But let me talk about Fanon in terms of religion a little bit. Because there's an ambiguity there. In the one end, Fanon was very critical of Christianity, but he also was critical of animist you know indigenous african religious practices he said they were mythologies they were superstitious they had no room for growth blah, blah blah like he was saying that unlike a lot of i would say you know contemporary discourses in post you know post-colonial african studies how these native or rather indigenous religions can offer a source of liberation because they are something outside of the template of western categories of faith that were largely, you know, brought on the backs of colonialism. Fanon rejects that, but yet at the same time, he equally says that you cannot find salvation in these, like, Western categories of understanding. Which, like, let's face it, the majority of the contemporary left, that's what they do. The whole, like, global south, third worldist fetishism, a lot of it was essentially... And Fanon says this, and I, I was talking about this with... um a year or two ago with Evan Platinum on Twitter, who has read Fanon as well. And he was saying that, you know, Fanon was on the money. That he recognized that you cannot dwell within, like, these, even these, like, critical theory concepts that were, like, created by Westerners and largely for Westerners in a Western understanding of things. But I was, I was reading this article. This article is on Fanon's position of religion. Uh, this comes from uh, Contending Modernities dot edu it you know f quote fanon's critique of religion winds up being a powerful critique of the secular contrary fanon seeks refuge in the secular in order to re signify the human but he ends up repurposing religion along the way so it talks about how you know in his clinical you know his patients in his clinical work they expressed religious sentiments that were contrary to science and 
the scientific method. He very much starts off with this like Freudian understanding that he pro you know, not just Freudian, but also this like Western, like secular scientific understanding of the psyche that he probably largely gleaned from Satra, who was, you know, like a lot of French academics, most of them critical of Catholicism and religion and belief. And, you know, Satra has a very, like, I would say, in the one end nuanced, but in other ways not really that nuanced, view of religion, like, through his atheism. It's certainly a much more, like, charitable and, like, meaningful and, I would say, thought-provoking atheism than the new atheist. But, well, you know, the picture of new atheism is very skewed in North America. Or, sorry, the picture of atheism in general. Because, like, like atheism is essentially, like, pro you know, Christ secularized, like, Protestant notions of God. You know, that's what they're rebelling against. But anyways, Fanon was critical of Catholicism being like the imperial religion of the French, but he wasn't critical of Islam. He viewed Islam as integral to the Algerian struggle. He was sympathetic to the inherent, I would say, perennial, you know, perennial doctrine of Islam. And he, you know, was not as critical of that, of, of Islam, as he was with Catholicism or the indigenous uh, you know, animist religions of the global south. So, Fenon's critique of the pernicious presence of religion in his socio-political life and his gesture to repurpose it as a vessel to resignify blackness remains understanding in contemporary Fenon scholarship. So he, he aimed to sort of repurpose it. He, he was trying to find a way of resistance that defies those secularized categories of understanding that were present in, you know, Western European societies. Which is funny because Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran does something very similar with Islam in terms of, you know, taking a non-Western form of resistance and repurposing it from explicitly religious grounds. Something that is approximating a revolutionary theory. But one that is not predicated upon Western liberal, you know, post-French Revolution humanism, basically. That is incredibly secular. So, Fanon, but yet Fanon always capitulates to the living and the here and now because that is what informs his theory of, like, revolutionizing psychology in the psyches of the living because the living is that which resists, right? So, he has this very complicated view of religion because he wants to, like, sort of disregard it as a man of science, but he can't disregard it, you know. So religion as to be a conceptual apparatus or constitutive element of a social fabric occupies a substantial place in the formation of anti-colonial struggles and throughout of which Fanon was a part. Reading Fanon and religion with these complexities in mind tends to an interesting twist and in insight. Fanon's critique of religion, political theology, ends up being a critique of the secular, even when he's not named it as such. His turn to secularist language as an alternative to religion seems to suggest an turn alternative notion of the sacred. The disavowal of colonial religion needs not disclaim the diverse forms of religion making that took place in and through various forms of decolon decolonial movements and imagination. The sacred molds in the spirit and movement of decolonial, decolonial resistances in the colony, but unlike the institutionalized forms and understandings of religion, the diverse registers of the sacred usually take murky shapes. Um, at the time they are presented as antitheses to the sacred, that is, as a disavowal of the dominant notion of the sacred is religion more broadly, yet even in negation, they are not renounced. So again, secularism itself is a lie in some respects. It's impossible. The secular dualities of theological edifices of both modernity and coloniality, coloniality, thus fostering a notion of modernity that distinguishes itself from the normative dogmatic values, secretary and positions and power. Secularization as well is another form of colonization. We see this all the time now. The violence of its theology and the theology of its violence are obscured by the no nominal framework of the secular. So it's an, a more advanced form of domination by just posing it as uh, scientific, right? So the trads and the post-colonials, they could sort of like, you know, that meme, the, the Schwarzenegger um, predator meme where they're like, you know, the, the, they're, they're shaking hands, you know? The, the implies in a way a nuanced critique of the theological edifices that sustain the necropolitical membembes management of the colonial world right even Arendt said you know i mean well we, we we can't say too much about you know the history of it but for for uh opsec purposes youtube purposes but he she said without increased secularization that that one event in the 20th century would have never happened 
without the sort of mass disenchantment of society. So it's very interesting how post-colonial theory intersects, but even Catholicism, even though Islam has been the revolutionary religion, on the political left at least, there was that sort of liberation theology moment. And there's sections within Catholicism that capitulate to post-colonial ideology. And I, I think even, strangely enough, orthodoxy, but in a different sense, for Eastern Orthodox Christians are doing the same now against the largely godless secular West. But that's, that's another discussion for another time. But it's very interesting how religion plays into it. And of course, religion on the political right is, you know, all about it. Like, I... I I truly believe that there there can be a secular political right, there is a Nietzschean political right, but in terms of a backbone of like most ordinary people on like in the right wing, uh my my position is that it's very it's kind of difficult to have a purely secular right wing. It can never happen in my opinion, you know, but that's that's just me and my own biases. And I'd be happy to argue with I'd be happy to discuss this with the Nietzschean, you know. But that's for another topic for another time. But I just wanted to say that this is what Fanon's fixation with the living is. But there's a paradox there because it implies that politics extends to the dead, which Mbebe is trying to say. So that's the whole crux of the book, really. His advice, so to oppose individuals who sought to rid themselves of race's burden, Fanon thus proposed a long course of therapy. This therapy begins in and through language and perception via the knowledge. So it's not just like, Yes, Fanon advocates for <laughs> violence, and there's a lot of passages where he's fed posting, but he's saying that the revolution is really internalized. And I think this is what has compelled leftist politics since, you know, at least the early 20th century. But the right wing is starting to see this as well. There is a sort of right wing psychology that is an affirmation of the Western, you know, based world subject. So revolution always happens from within. Even, you know, it's funny because when you take Franz Fanon and you take Julius Evola, for instance, it's like they're not similar in any way, but you could see that their thought processes about the nature of modernity is, you know, there's some staggering points of dialogue there. Maybe not similarities, but points of dialogue between like Gunyan and uh, Franz Fanon and maybe Julius Evola. But well, I mean, that's, really edgy to say that but i think that like the psychology of politics and political right is something interesting how it's in a way mimicking or it's rather coming to the same conclusions as the left where it's like yes the revolution starts from within it's the psychology of the subject that really matters you know so the therapy begins in through language perception via knowledge of the fundamental reality according to which becomes a human being and the world means accepting one's being exposed to the other it continued with a colossal work on oneself with new experiences of the body of movement of being together and even of communion and shared commonality that is most alive and vulnerable in humanity and possibly also new experiences of the practice of violence. This violence was to be directed against the colonial system. The system's particularly particularity lay in its manufacturing a panoply of suffering that in response solicited neither the acceptance of responsibility nor solitude nor sympathy and often not even pity. To the contrary, it did everything to deaden people's capacity to suffer because the natives were suffering, everything to dull their ability to be affected by the suffering. Hmm. I wonder what's happening in the West now. But, well, eh, that's very interesting. Uh, what's happening in the West now? By the claiming to be acting on behalf of the interests of the natives... Thus, in their steed, the colonial machinery sought not merely to block their desire to live. It aimed to affect and diminish their capacities to consider themselves moral agents. But notice the reverse of that. Notice that you are not a subject. You are just a living body. That is a... But also, what's funny is that Fanon's critique of like liberal humanism is also implicit there. That really it's the whole, like, white man's bird, noble savage, like, we're here to save you sort of nonsense that still, ironically enough, propels liberal leftist politics. But see, you know, the activists, they don't really, they're not really good at reading comprehension when it comes to it. So, well, yeah. Fanon's critical and political 
practice stood resolutely opposed to this colonial order. Better than others, he put his finger on one of the great contradictions inherited from, modern, from the modern era, one that is his time struggled to resolve, the vast movement of repopulation of the world in inaugurated at the edge of modern times ended in a massive taking of lands, colonialization, on a scale and using, and using technologies never before seen in the history of humanity. Far from leading to democracy spread across the planet, the race for new lands opened onto a new law, nomos of the earth, the main characteristic of which was to establish war and race as history's two primitive privileged sacraments. Privileged sacraments. The sacramentalization of war and race in the blast furnace of colonialism made it once modernity's antidote and poison to twofold pharmacon. Modernity breeds in, like, its secularization and disenchantment. War, race, you know, biology, those things become a form of sacredness. But now we're seeing, like, the inverse of it. We're seeing, in, in like, contemporary liberal modernity. It's no longer the other. The other comes to us now. But now we are the sort of, like, displaced populations, right? Not not that Mbebe would say that, but I'm saying, like, the logic... That's the brilliance of reading Fanon's, because you could, like, literally take a lot of these points and repurpose it and say, well, the logic is sort of coming home now. What happens when these colonial powers, like, totally demoralize themselves into, you know, into oblivion? Well, in these conditions, though Fanon, through Fanon, sorry, in these conditions, thought Fanon, decolonization as a constituting political event could hardly forego the use of violence. In any case, a primitive active force Violence pre-existed the advent of decolonization, which constituted its setting in motion as animated body able to completely and unreservedly deal with which, being interior and external to it, prevented it from arriving at this concept. But pure and unlimited violence, however creative it was, set on being, could never be safeguarded from potential blindness. If caught in a sterile repetition, it could denigrate at any moment and its energy be placed in the service of destruction for destruction's sake. For its part, the primitive function of the medical gesture was not the absolute eradication of illness or the suppression of death and the advent of immortality. The ill human, the Ill human was the human with no family, no love, no human relations, and no communion with the community. Again, the Muslim, the, the state of exception, bare life. And so it's funny because the, the previous two years is also a form of necropolitics, which I think Mumbebi in recent lectures talks about this. Of origins, the world of people without bond or people who aspire only to take their leave of others is still with us, albeit in ever shifting configurations. It inhabits the twists and turns of renewed uh, vamophobia certain people I can't say on YouTube, the, you know, J-phobia and its mimic counterpart, Islamophobia. It inhibits the desire for apartheid and endogamy that harry our epoch and engulfs us in the hallucinatory dream of a community without strangers. Well, almost everywhere the law of blood, the law of Italian and the duty to one's race, the two supplement of atavistic nationalism are res resurfacing. The hitherto more or less hidden violence of democracies is rising to the surface, producing the lethal circle that grips the imagination is increasingly difficult to, difficult to escape. Now, again, I, of course, disagree with Fennon. I think, I'm sorry, not Fennon. I disagree with Mbebe in that he thinks that democracy breeds this, but I all I see is that democracy is desperate to, like, destroy this, to snuff it out, to call it this sort of new, you know, civil rights regime say that this is evil and we should prevent this and that actually all of your concerns are null and void and that you're even evil for thinking it and that like western populations probably deserve their own fate and that and, like this is very much the canadian government there was one person on twitter that said it uh, a, a follower of mine that you know uh the, the operation model of the canadian government is like well you deserve it because you're evil and this is why we're doing it to you and you're gonna love it so but that's you know that's my bias. But this is, you know, from the perspective of academia, at least, this is what they think. So, little by little, a terror that is molecular in essence, in so molecular in the rhizomatic Deleuzian sense of a molecule that d 
that that cuts across different planes of imminence, right? Constitutes itself a formal organization of death, little by little, a terror that is molecular in essence and allegedly defensive in seeking legitimation by blurring the relations between violence, murder, and law, faith, commandment, and obedience. The norm and the exception, and even freedom tracking and security. No, lo So again, freedom and security, they're almost conflated into one. But also faith, violence, and so forth. No longer is the concern to eliminate via the law and justice murder from the books of life in common. Every occasion now is one in which the supreme stakes is to be risked. Neither the human of terror nor the terrorized human, both of them now substitutes for the citizen for swear murder. On the contrary, when they do not purely and simply believe in death, given or receive, giving or receiving, they take it as the ultimate guarantee of a history's tempered in iron and steel, the history of being. Whoa. Whoa. Fan <laughs> Fanon's concern from start to finish in his thinking as well as his practice bore out the irreducibility of human link, the inseparability of humanity and the other living creatures, as well as the vulnerability of humankind and the especially of the ill human of war. Further, the case required to write the li living into time the chapter that follows, the chapters that follow, deal with these interrogations, diagnostically and through, through altering figures. As Fenon enviced a particular solitude towards Africa and permanently linked his fate to the continent's own, the African world has naturally come to occupy the forefront of the reflection herein. Chapter 5 and 6. There are most certainly names that refer little to things but instead pass above or alongside them. Their function is one of disfiguration and distortion. This is why the thing in truth tends to resist both the name and all translation. This is not because the thing sports a mask, but because its force of proliferation renders every qualifier superfluous for with. For Fanon, such was the case for Africa and its mask. The, I'm going to say this, the African, let's just say that's the, you know, it's, it's the gamer word. Uh, but with the R-O, you know. I, again, I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Did the thing African simply operate as a catch-all entity, woodly and devoid of historical weight or depth, or the subject of which anyone could say almost anything without its leading to any consequences? Or did it have its own force and thus constitute a project able by virtue of its own reser reserves of li life to reach its own concept and write itself into the new planetary age? So again, like the, the language of the colonized, right? Like the language imposed that you're African, you are tribal, you have no history, the way that Europeans conceptualize history. Like, you know, this is, is Fenon 101. That you have no history, no, that your language is primitive, that you are a sort of noble savage living in stasis forever. So Fanon attended closely to people's experiences of surfaces and depths, of lights and reflections and of shadows, his endeavor to report on the words of living beings, the worlds of living beings and the words, without foundering in repetition. As regard finally mean, final meanings, he knew that they were to be sought in the structure as much as its obscure side of life, where the extraordinary attention that he gave to language, speech, music, theater, dance, ceremony settings, and all sorts of technical objects and psychical structures. That said, this essay is not about that singing back the dead, but rather aims to evoke its, fra its fragmentary fashion, a great thinker of transfiguration. Again, the dead factoring into those ceremonies. Because the dead very much determined the course of politics can, you know, in the contemporary world. In doing so, I found nothing more appropriate than a figure style of writing that oscillates between the, vest uh, the vertiginous dissolution and dispersal. This style is one composed of crisscrossed loops, the edges and lines of which meet back up with their vanishing point each time. Again, Agamben is very similar in his exploration of paradoxes. The reader will have understood language's function in such writing as to return to life, which has been abandoned by the power of death. Death being abandoned by life, which is a very interesting concept. Because death hover hovers above life in so many circumstances. It is reopen access to the de deposits of the future, beginning with the future of those in whom not so long ago it was hard to say which part pertained to the human and which to the animal, object, thing, or common, com commodity. So all these death, in a way, brings about these harmonizations of relations. 
between animal, between living being, between human, between commodity, everything becomes that because it is in the wake of death that all these things become a part of a greater process that are streamlined. Death in a way weaponizes desubjectivization and de-origination of things. It harmonizes in the same, you know, it sort of instrumentalizes them. What is in framing? To take stock of something, like a fish market, to capture the fish, to, you know, that is common stock, to eat it. Like, like you know, that, this is, in a way, commodification relies on this sort of weaponization of death to put something in standing reserve. You cut down a tree, you're cutting down the growth and vitality of that tree. It becomes wood, becomes lumber. So human populations, after the age, you know, during and after the age of colonization, this is Mbebe's big point, is that all of life becomes standing reserve. But let's take a break. Let's get into chapter. Now, finally, to the meat of the book. This is Exit from Democracy, Chapter 1. So, um, Bembe says that he has a three-pronged approach. But first he says that uh, the time of repopulation, the planetary, the planetary realization of the world under the aegis of militarism and capital, and an ultimate con consequence, a time of exit from democracy or its inversion, and then he will focus backwards. So, of course, he's going to give a history of these concepts that led to the sort of modern, quote-unquote, inversion of democracy. But I find it funny in that, you know, you could talk about the inversion of democracy, but really, <laughs> maybe it was a lie to begin with. But he says that there are three approaches he's taking, transversal approaches, attentive to three motifs of opening, crossing, and circulation or acceleration. He says the approach, so again, I'm, I'm going to dot through the different chapters, the, the pertinent points in this sort of lecture style. The approach set out from proposition according to which a gen genus deconstruction, a genuine deconstruction of the world of our time, but also I would say a genus as well, begins with a full re recognition of the performance, uh, the pre preforce provincial status of our discourse and the necessary regional character of our concepts. And therefore, with a critique of every form of abstract universalism. So again, this is his critique of democracy. If democracy is deconstructing, it ultimately rests on its universalist assumptions as the reason why it is faltering in his view. Global thinking, now, so as uh, Menyot line for a major part of what passes as global thinking now, now global thinking can only ever be that which turning its back on theoretical se segregation rests on the archives of what Edward Glissant calls all world, tout monde, meaning like that, that's its part of its universalization at the heart of democracy. Reversion, in, so this subheading, reversion, inversion, acceleration. So he talks about the repopulation of the earth in the view of the demographic transition now underway thanks to the world of the South are coming to modernity involved decisive events such as the geographical and cultural uprooting of entire populations, as well as their voluntary relocation. Well, voluntary relocation or forced settlement across the vast territories once inhabited by indigenous peoples on the Atlantic side of the planet, two significant moments, both tied to the expansion of industrial capitalism, gave rhythm to the process of redistribution of populations across the planet. Moments of colonization, slavery, he goes into it. In America, slave labor of African origins was put to work as a vast project to support the environment 
in view of its rational pro and profitable development. Planetary, uh, several regions of plantation regime was essential about cutting down, burning, routinely raising forests and trees, about replacing the natural vegetation with cotton and sugarcane. Then he goes, and this is the important part, this is page 10. Here life comes to be shaped according to an essential racial principle, but thus understood race far from being simply biological signifier, referred to a worldless and soilless body, a body of combustible energy, a sort of doubt, double of nature that could through work be transformed into an available reserve or a stock. So it's very funny that on the one hand, it's funny. Uh, I was actually listening at the time of this recording. I was listening to a night owl space. Now they don't record it. Um, Future Moldovan citizen and nightmare vision on, on Twitter. And Peter Nemitz was in and he was talking about, and it is, I, I will state right away. I, I truly believe this as well that the academic quibbling over racism being a quote-unquote modern construction, that that's pretty much a lie. Racism, or sorry, racialism, I would say, was at the heart of, what did Nemitz say, at least since Mesopotamia? And, you know, I would consider him an outsider authority on all things archaeological, genealogical, historic when it comes to migrations of, of peoples and races and genealogies and so forth, haplogroups. So, yes, I mean, even, you know, Genesis, uh, even the Old Testament was filled with it. It was about, you know, the the quasi, at least in part, the quasi-racial survival of certain tribes. And, you know, so racism, in, in while well, racialism, racial categories existed a lot longer. But when academics talk, such as... Um, Mbembe talks about, uh, you know, the categorization of peoples. It, what he's doing is he's saying that this is a modern concept in the sense of a particular form of instrumental rationality is guiding the hand of these racial categories, right? Now, people always had a sense of their ethnicity and their place in the world. But notice what he's doing. He's doing something that I would even say a lot of trads on the political right would say. He's almost taking a Heideggerian approach. Although Heidegger would, you know, of course, agree with the concept of rootedness, which, as we all know, is problematic and racialist. And, you know, academics, they're like, that's evil, that's bad. But I would say that um, Bambembe is saying that this is an invention in terms of a body that is pure material that then is reconstituted into a exploitable machinic technics orientated stock to be manipulated and framed. That was the, the North Atlantic slave trade more or less. But he's also saying, and which makes it very interesting is that, you know, of course he's very pro like, yeah, you know, <laughs> he's very, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's pro refugee and migrant and, you know, racial, liberal, democratic egalitarianism and so forth, anti-racism. But he does bring up the critique, even though he, he's smart enough to be aware of it. The fact that a lot of people lament this for a reason, but he brings up like talking points that you'd find on like, you know, Paul a few years ago. Maybe not that far, but certainly among like more racially conscious people on the you know political right and on the political left, of course, because I would argue that most of the political left is racially conscious in a different way. But he's saying that the migration of peoples has brought the world into a form of instability. That the global south for the first time not only is becoming a player, but the sort of relocation of those peoples will have dramatic consequences for the current order of things. Now, someone on the political right would say, yeah, that's true, and it's bad. A leftist would say, yes, it's true, and it's good. It's shaking up the order. But this line alone right here is, you know, says it all about the best territories, but also he's saying about the he keeps coming back to this, the repopulation of the earth, meaning that the conceptual, the cultural space 
is now in the hands of the global south. Not totally, but rather they're being brought into the awareness of society, which he means Western society, more or less. The sort of the sons and daughters of the Enlightenment, you know. So that's what he's saying. Lennox said the two significant moments, both the tied to expansion of industrial capitalism, but all of this is at the behest of capital. He keeps going back to that, like most critical theorists. This is the forces of late capitalism bringing this stock into geographic rootlessness for the purposes of industry. Now, if you are someone in the political right, you have a different theory of this. If you were on the left, you'd say, yes, it's all capital, but also it's a good thing because, well, you know, the migration of peoples, it's good. Uh, One billion, what's... uh, What's the number? What's the number that you know, Matty Iglesias has? It's like one one uh, bazillion Americans. I don't know, um, one Googleplex Americans. You know, but that's a liberal notion. That's very much the neoliberal view of it, where people are just stock to move around. Like a, a real critical theorist leftist analysis would also question this mass migration of peoples. A lot of times by force. Of course, he would abstract this and say that the forces of industrial capital and post-industrial capital necessitates the movement of peoples in different ways and in various micro crises and population bottlenecks and so forth. But, you know, this is all the hermeneutics around the core issue. So let's move on. Colonization thrives by excretion those by excreting those who were in several regions deemed superfluous, a surfeit with the colonial nation. This was the case in particular of poor views of discouraging off society of vagabonds and the delinquents such as harmful to the nation. Colonization was a technology for regulatory migratory movements. So again, he's very much going to the past. I'm going to skip some of the parts where he talks about slavery and so forth. I mean, we all basically know um, the thesis. So the 19th century, the two modalities of repopulation, the repopulating the planet through human predation, natural wealth extraction, setting subaltern groups to work constituted the majority, the major economic, political, and in many respects, philosophic states of this, stakes of this period. So he's saying, again, this is classic critical theory, that the assumptions of the Enlightenment populace in these times in the West was, you know, you had to otherize people because we are so sophisticated as opposed to the Global South, or, well, they didn't call it the Global South, but as opposed to colonized peoples. And, you know, even racial theorists like Gobineau come out of this milieu as well. Um, scientific positivists of their time. Uh, in, in America, in the 19th century, you have figures like, like uh, Lothrop Stoddart that thought about society explicitly organized along racial lines, but those racial lines constitute both a threat and an opportunity for the overclass and so forth. You know, this is classic. A, a lot of talking points reiterated by a lot of, like, let's call them, you know, white gnats. Uh, a lot of them are older than what we think. You know, a lot of this comes, like, and it's funny because people like Academic Agent rediscovering Garbineau, right? So, it also is necessary to consider the general conventional distinction between commercial colonialism, even trade post-colonialism, and settler colonialism, properly speaking. So again, this is classic critical theory. Let's move on. The repopulation, the repeopling of the earth at the beginning of the modern era did not only pass through colonization. Religious factors also go towards expanding and explaining the migrations and mobilizations, the revocation of edicts of uh, Nantes, uh, the Huguenots, fled France, religious wars, so on and so forth. From the viewpoint accelerating, so this is chapter uh, one, number 12 uh, page 12 from the viewpoint the accelerating age of human groupings in the world's wealthy nations represent an event of considerable impact it is the opposite of the aforementioned demographic surplus typical of the 19th century geographic distance such as such no longer represents an obstacle to mobility the coming together of peoples that is what is the mover and shaker of history the the sort of littling of the world through through techniques through mobility then later communications technologies, as he will discuss later on. The new swarming, which adds to the previous wave of migration from the South, blurring criteria of national belonging. To belong to the nation is no longer merely an affair of origin, but also of choice. You know, civic nationalism, right? 
this is the, we don't think of these things we we don't think of these things that liberal modernity requires these meshing togethers of peoples it requires it as the engine of capital to say that peoples no longer matter the nation state is dissolving before our eyes because of the mass migration of and what he calls the repopulating reworlding of people into a different context of origin because you have to remember uh you know Achille Mbembe is, you know, he's largely a part of that African tradition of thinkers. He still is allowing for that space of saying that, you know, maybe this whole globalization thing, maybe it derooting peoples isn't such a, you know, automatic good. So even though he wants to defend democracy, I truly believe, and again, I'm not putting, I, I don't want to put words on his mouth, so caution this. I'm certainly no Mbembe scholar, but from what I can tell, he is critiquing democracy, even though he still has a romantic attachment to the promises of modern democracy. So, it's not a matter of being your groups or families of beings as such. At the limit, it is a matter of neither the environment nor of nature. It is one of agents and milieus of life, water, air, dust, microbes, termites, bees, insects. This is authors of specific relations. We have therefore passed from the human condition to the terrestrial condition. Geography. And again, he's also getting this from Deleuze. The, ge the geology of morals and so forth. He's, you know, it's geographic thinking rather than the thinking of an in-group within an environment that very rarely engages the other. We have to think in terms of geography now. And philosophy in this time also takes that term turn with the engagement of the other, hence when he talks about Hegel later on in the book. So, so the moving on, skipping ahead in page 13, uh, the earth and humans inhabit and explore as merely passive object of humankind interventions. So it is also with the idea according to which of all living species, humans are the only ones to have in part freed themselves from their animality. Having broken the chain of biological necessity, human humanity and humans had allegedly almost raised itself to the level of the divine yet contrary to the articles of faith and many others is now admitted that humankind is only part of a greater set of universal living su subjects which also includes animals uh vegetal plants and other species so again this is typical post-humanism so the point being is that even our understanding of humanity collapses. And what is the engine? Two things, technics and capital, are the engines of dissolving our notion of what humanity is in terms of our engagement with the other. Even though we've transcended the mere animal, we are still a part of a greater cornucopia of life. But this itself is alienating in a sense. Because then we can also be reduced once more to that animality. And so, let's move on. Going no further than biology and genetic engineering, there can be a said, pro pro uh, properly speaking, that no essence of man to safeguard, no human nature to protect. This being the case, the potential to modify the biological, the genealogical, and genetic structures of humanity is almost limitless. At the bottom, by opening up the genetic and germinal populations and manipulations, it is thought to be possible not only to enhance the human being, but also in the spectacular act of self-creation to produce the living through techno-medicine. So he's doing a very interesting leap before we get to the second um, paragraph, which is called The Nocturnal Body of Democracy. The third constitutive feat of the era is the generalized introduction of tools in calculating or computation, computational machines into all aspects of social life, aided by the power and ubiquity of the digital phenomenon, no impenetrable separation exists between the screen and life. So this, this is a territory that I write about quite a bit. No separation between the screen and life. As a result, the works of, so face-to-face -face encounters of the portrait or figure of the mirroring presence doubling, uh, the subject is tested. As a result, the working of subjectivation and individuation by which until only recently, every human being becomes a person endowed with a more or less inexhortable identity is partly foreclosed. Whether one wants it or not, the era is thus one of plasticity, pollination, grafting of all sorts, plasticity of the brain, pollination of the artificial and the organic, gener genetic relations and information graphs, ever finer adjustments between the human and the machine, a parlay at large, 
all these mutations do not only give free reign to the dream of truly limitless life, they henceforth make power over the living, or again the capacity to voluntarily alter the human species, the absolute form of power. But then he's saying, like, this is, of course, you know, rooted in racism and colonialism and so forth. Then, finally, in the page 15, before I give my analysis, I'm, I'm jotting through all of these. I'm making, actually, I'm making quite good progress compared to, uh, compared to, <laughs> you know, reading word by word with uh, the Byung-Chul Han books. Tail sorts of military machines continue to play this role on top of the capitalist market, which in turn functions more than ever according to the model of warfare. The tight Im uh, imbre imbrication of capital, digital technologies, nature, and war. This tight imbrication, uh, this, the new constellations of power that it makes possible, is without a doubt what most directly threatens the idea of the political, that Hithro served as the bedrock for the form of government that is democracy. Again, very much Huotanian. Very Byung-Chul Han. Very much so. But notice how he makes that leap from colonialism and the technologies of expansion and human stock as technology to a redivinization of the human as something above nature. But that notion, that instrumental notion of reason that we are above nature, that contributes to the society's perpetual warfare. The war against the other, the war against nature, the war against for race and so forth. This is what Mumbembe is saying. This is like the apex of a lot of critical theory around issues of technology and race and society and so forth. So the same ethos of technics propels us forward. But now because we've abstracted ourselves away from that original position of what made democracy in the ancient world, for instance what made it possible because of our notions of what a human is. That is what contributed to democratic thought. The demos in Greek society. Aristotle talks about man as a political animal. So our notions of the human and our notions of the political arrangement of society always was there from the beginning. But this experiences fundamental shifts with the techniques that society takes up and adopts. From the, you know, he's makes, he makes this line. And, you know, ironically enough, Heidegger makes the same when he says that the wheat thresher is, there's a direct look, you know, it's controversial when Heidegger said it, you know, given the context of the particular uh, painter of Austrians regime that he was a part of. He said, you know, near the end of his life that you can make this direct line between the, the wheat thresher and the camps. Mbembe is saying that you can make this direct line between the slave ship and the screen. Because... All of those things, they have the same effect. They reduce the human to founding stock. To, sorry, to, to standing reserve, to stock. But the screen does something else. It gives us the impression of God. But it leaves very much still the question hanging in the air of our humanity. And what it truly means to be a human when we engage with the non-human other. This is very, very hot contemporary debates in philosophy right now. I mean, well, let's face it. In critical theory and literature departments, because philosophy departments, they're pretty much dead in North America. But let's say that the screen, you know when Nietzsche said that, um, that Napoleon was half a beast and half an overman? What do you think humanity is with technology? And in that sense, Nietzsche had a predictive power. That we are half beast and half overman. So think of it that way. Thing, but let's move on to the nocturnal body of democracy because again he is the quintessential Foucauldian scholar democracy is a leviathanic body and you must think of it as a body with organs that rearrange ever so often right so uh, saying that democracy is a body that's sort of like a concept being a, a physical body or rather a virtual body that's like your combination of the thinking from Foucault, Deleuze, and so forth. And there were other people that influenced their thought, you know, I mean, like even Blanchot uh, with critical texts and so forth. I mean, there, there's other... Foucault also had a bunch of influences from French physicalists and, and uh, you know, physical psychologists and so forth that, you know, philosophy of science people that he strongly identified with that talk about the social body. But also even Garbineau in, in the, you know, incredibly 
stellar racist version talks about the social body as well as the body of, of the people of the ethnos of the race. So this, so when you think of democracy as a body and the control and governmentality of bodies, this is the basis for a lot of critical theory, but let's move on for, but before I move on, I have a critical point actually not to Bembe, but rather to the James Lindsay's of the world, the intellectual dark, dork, oh, sorry, dark web, those like anti-woke liberals, what they can never get, what they don't see, you know, I, I could be just being unfair to James Lindsay, is that when they critique this sort of like critical race theory, which I mean, a lot of it is worthy of critique and should be critiqued, obviously. I mean, it is, let's face it, thoroughly against, um, you know, European... Uh, you know, I don't have to say it, but what they don't get is that the one thing that they'll never be capable of critiquing is the one thing that they love because it's the driving force of liberal modernity, which is technics, not just capital, but technics itself being a driving force of alienation and racial animus and the moving of people's like, this is what they mean by, like, this is when people like Mbembe critique, like, you know, European civilization from a post-colonial perspective. They're saying that they unleashed upon the world the most derooting force there is, right? Which is techno-capital, which is instrumental reason. But these, you know, anti-woke liberals, they're like, no, that's, that's, you know, that's terrible, that's barbaric. That's superstitious because James Lindsay, he's really just, uh, you know, he's just a new atheist at heart. So he never will really take that leap to critique the, you know, poison fruits and promises of liberalism, which have largely grafted its success onto technology. I mean, this is an old neo-reactionary point, but it's true. It's, it's sort of like where, you know, again, like neo-reactionaries and critical theorists can sort of shake the hand and be like, you know what? That's true. Liberalism attached itself to the quote-unquote progress of techno-capital and technics, or nowadays in the digital world, what I would call hyper-technics. So, but moving on to the nocturnal body of democracy.